everybody. Uh, we are now at the Instituto de Estudios Urbanos y Territoriales um, with Professor Susan Feinstein. And we will talk a little bit um, about the Just City, Urban Theory, and Urban Planning. All these issues that are very important nowadays uh, for our cities. So thank you very much, Susan, for being here and for this conversation. Um, the first uh, question uh, have to do with a recent book, uh, The Cities for People, Not for Profit. Uh -huh. Maybe you know that book. And a chapter uh, from Neil Brenner. Uh, it was uh, called, uh, What is Critical Urban Theory? Mm -hmm. In this chapter, he concludes a very interesting idea that is that critical urban theory could be and should be critical, but it's still theory. <laughs> so, or in other words, not necessarily linked to action. Yes. Yeah. So this is interesting because many times our academic research is request to have a public or social commitment, a militant action. But it's difficult to be on both, both sides. Yes. So, um, I remember about that always the distinction between the politician and the scientist of Max Weber. So the question is, what is your opinion about this dilemma? Well, I've always been troubled by the disciplines, the regular disciplines, you might say, uh, philosophy. I, my own degree is in political science, and it always seemed to me that it was too remote from what was actually happening in the world, and that there was too strict a division between political philosophy, political theory, then the study of political behavior without ever evaluating what the outcome of political behavior was. I've been particularly conscious of it because teaching planners, planners really want to know what to do, not simply an explanation of what happened. Uh, I am a critical theorist, which means that you examine uh, the world critically. You don't uh, say, oh yes, I'm for Bolonisaro, or I'm for Donald Trump, or even I'm for um, Maduro, or somebody else, uh, Castro. But rather, what it means is that uh, you look at what's actually happening on the ground, you examine it critically, you say what's right, what's wrong, you try to explain what happened. Uh, but also, if you're concerned with teaching, planning, or public policy, you have to proceed from your theoretical ideas to ones that are, some may not tell you what, not not give you a recipe, but at least give you a direction in which to go. So I'm, Neil and I aren't totally in agreement. I don't think mm -hmm. about this. Uh, when I started to write my book, The Just City, um, I knew the general question I wanted to ask, which was how do you uh, look at a city and say what is just? Uh, but I didn't really, I wasn't that familiar with how philosophers looked at the question of justice. Uh, so I actually took a course. I mean, everybody else was 25 and I was, uh, <laughs> 60s, uh, but uh, I took a course uh, at the New School for Social Research with a visiting professor from Germany who's a very eminent uh, German philosopher uh, in theories of justice. Uh, so he introduced me to uh, theorists or philosophers with whom uh, I maybe knew the names but had never read their works carefully. Uh, but and it was very enlightening, it was very good, and I used what I learned in that course to develop my theoretical argument in the book. But I don't think you can stop there. I think you have to go on from what you know, well, the general argument about what constitutes justice, uh, to a more particular argument of saying, well, how does this work itself out in the city? Uh, what are just actions? Uh, what is a just public policy? Uh, the other aspect of philosophy is it might say what is the most just or what is perfect justice? 
uh, but you're never going to have that in real life. Uh, so my question was really, what's it? Not what is the just city, but what is the more just city compared to what we have at the moment? In the just city, you mentioned three important dimensions to move towards this idea. Diversity, democracy, and equity. Among the most concrete measures to move uh, towards there, and with regard to the case of Amsterdam, you mentioned the need to increase the stock of public housing destined to low-income groups. Mm -hmm. In Latin America, and particularly in Chile, we are very far off this possibility, given that there is no public housing, but rather a public, uh, private market subsidized through a voucher to people. It is often argued that the high value of land is the main impediment to locating low-income housing in quality urban land. So, my question is, what previous or minimum common steps are necessary for a just city, considering these cities and countries, which, without necessarily being poor, poorer, have more pro-market mechanisms? Yes, well... Uh, the introduction of such strong market orientation uh, and the argument that says that uh, markets or housing markets operate more efficiently uh, if you let the market set the price. So if you want to provide housing for poor people, this is the standard conventional argument. Uh, instead of building housing for them, what you do is give them a voucher, give them a rent subsidy. Give it so that they can enter the market and compete in the market. Now, this might work if you really gave them a big enough rent subsidy that, so that they could compete with rich people, but of course you, they don't and they can't. And also, many landlords don't wish to rent to people who uh, are low income because they think that they will uh, destroy the property or commit crimes or, in general, not enhance the value of the property. Uh, so, uh, people who have rent vouchers are very limited in their choices to begin with. Uh, then, uh, it's, the subsidy is practically never adequate uh, to really get people into very good housing. Uh, and so that's a problem. But also, it's not rational for private developers to develop low-income housing, uh, because they can make much more money by developing luxury housing. So that uh, there's never enough housing produced simply by market forces uh, to house low-income people. Uh, if you look back, speaking of the United States, uh, to the 19th century, uh, what you see is that there was a, a considerable amount of low-income housing in the form of tenements built for uh, poor working people. Uh, but the only way that they could make a profit from building this kind of housing was by intense levels of crowding. Mm -hmm. So if you're not going to have very high levels of crowding, then it's never really um, sense of rational for private developers to build housing for people who are poor. Now, one of the ways that this is sometimes done, uh, New York has it now, uh, well, there are two ways. One uh, is called inclusionary zoning, and you can say that any developer who's going to build in this area has to include some number of units for low-income people. Or you can say that if the developer builds for low-income people, then uh, he can get more, he or she can get more space uh, than is allowed under the zoning. Uh, if uh, some number of units are provided for low-income people. Now, these two approaches are used fairly widely in neoliberal um, societies, uh, and they produce some amount of housing, but it's minuscule compared to the level of need. Uh, so uh, the only way that you really get large amounts of housing built for low-income people is if the government builds it. Now, the government historically in many places uh, has built it to a low standard uh, and, and so it creates slums in some way. Uh, but there are countries and places uh, where uh, 
it's done to a high standard. Amsterdam is one of them. Uh, Singapore, which I've studied recently, uh, is another. Uh, so that uh, people who are middle class are happy to live in public housing. And that means that the housing is income in integrated uh, and that there is a sufficient supply for low income people. That actually used to be the case in London too, uh, before Margaret Thatcher, uh, when they built so called council housing, uh, which meant that um, the local governing body, London has 33 boroughs, each one has a council, and uh, the consuls actually received money from central government to build housing, and they built tens of thousands of units of housing. Uh, Margaret Thatcher introduced uh, what was called right to buy, and that meant that uh, people who lived in public housing could buy their unit. Uh, what happened, of course, was uh, all those who lived in desirable neighborhoods bought their unit, and those who lived in undesirable neighborhoods or in the least well-built council housing didn't, and so it created income segregation which hadn't previously existed. Uh, but it is up to the state, it's only the state that can, well let me put it another way, if you have income inequality and therefore a lot of people who are low income and in a city where there are also a lot of people who are middle and high income, uh, then the only way that you're going to have adequate provision of housing for the low income is through state provision. And Latin American cities are highly segregated in terms of social and spatial terms. Mm -hmm. One of the five principles of the Chilean Urban Development National Policy is social integration, which is mainly materialized through the equitable access of all citizens to urban public goods. It has been criticized that urban and housing policies do not go further here in Chile in terms of promoting mechanisms that ensure the supply of social housing in well-served neighborhoods and therefore of middle and high incomes. Is the fair access to quality public goods enough to promote the just city? or this position can be considered as part of an incremental approach to increasing fairness? Well, when you say quality public goods, what, what do you mean? Parks, transportation, uh -huh. um, metro stations, yes. um, hospitals, schools. Well, I would say that it improves things, uh, but it certainly doesn't um, break down segregation and one of the issues with schools is always that if you have a high level of segregation, uh, then children who go to schools that are nearby are going to be going to schools that are segregated where the other students are also poor and likely don't come from a culture that values education very highly. Uh, almost all the research on education indicates that uh, who you go to school with is just as important as the resources put into the school uh, as in terms of ch children learning. That if you are part of a pure culture that says learning, you know, that trying to learn in school shows you're a, a door, that uh, smart people in their terms are the ones who try and get out of going to school and don't do their homework and show that, uh, that they're cool, uh, mm -hmm. that if that's the general culture of the school, the children aren't going to learn regardless of uh, making available quality public goods. Mm -hmm. And of course, well-to-do people aren't going to want to send their children to the same schools as uh, poor children. But also just, uh, if you live in a large neighborhood of nothing but poor people, then necessarily the schools that your children are going to go to uh, are going to be nearby and are going to have other poor children in them. Now we will... Am I supposed to be looking at... Yes. <laughs> this one, please. This one. Um, I will bring you, bring you again um, to this urban theory concepts. Um, we know a, a book that was published two years ago, um, The New Critical Perspectives on Urban Theory, 
uh, and it's it's very interesting because um, they organize the chapters in new scales of analysis. For example, um, bodies, mobilities, materiality, play, uh, affect, rhythm, and so on. But also with uh, other concepts with a larger tradition in urban studies like community, governance, informality, or even neoliberalism. So, how do you see these emerging themes for the understanding of the urban problem? Or are there just uh, contextual issues but not structural issues in the production of space or yeah. the understanding of the production of space? I'm not sure that it enhances, and it's a book that I haven't read so that I can't really speak to it very well, but I'm not sure that this kind of formal theorizing uh, gets you very far, and that uh, the most important thing to me for a theorist is to be able to um, move between the empirical and the theoretical. And the empirical can be either data or it can be case studies, and the method I've always used is comparative case studies, uh, in which you try to explain why you find say, substantial public housing in Singapore and none in Chile. Uh, and then, once you've attempted to explain it, then to go the other direction and say, well, what variables can be changed? What can we do to produce uh, more public housing in Chile? Uh, that um, the kind of theorizing which is simply at the level of I guess I would call it semantics, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, it's interesting uh, for other theorists, but it doesn't express an audience beyond uh, a very kind of rarefied group of people who are interested in that kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult to link it with real problems, maybe? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, there is this whole bunch of theorists now, like Zizek is an example, uh, who I find very difficult to read uh, because it's so abstract. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem with very abstract theory is it just leads to more abstract theory, which becomes a kind of game. Uh, I guess it all started with the uh, with people like Derrida and uh, critical theorists in the humanities, and then moved into especially geography of the of the disciplines. Uh, but I find it, and this is just kind of a personal reaction. I find it kind of arid uh, because I because I really think that the importance of critical theory is to examine what happens to people and why it happens. Uh, I mentioned yesterday when I would whenever was today before yesterday uh, with uh, when I was speaking to people on the institute uh, that uh, if you go back to the works that revolutionized urban theory of uh, Castells and Harvey in the uh, 70s uh, that this was because they said look we see these cities with enormous inequality uh, we see the rise of urban popular movements we see the hegemony of capital uh, how do we explain this and then what have people tried to do about it? And what are the ways in which popular actions affect it? Uh, if you don't have that kind of, and well, uh, Marx, who of course was the influencer of them, said that the point is not to describe the world, it's to change it. Uh, so uh, these people were revolutionary in a, say in an academic sense, uh, because they, theorized in order to produce theories of how you change the world. Uh, and that, uh, since then, I'm not sure that there have been very remarkable steps forward uh, in terms of, um, of theorizing about urban politics and urban social movements. There's been a great deal of useful empirical work. Uh, there's been, I think, the most important uh, further work had to do with regulation theory, uh, which really responded to the rise of neoliberalism and the way in which uh, a hegemonic ideology then uh, created this 
created a structure uh, when which action uh, from beneath became very difficult. Uh, that what we see is the rise of urban social movements and then a huge amount of reaction to it, uh, conservative reaction. And what we see right now is uh, that this conservative reaction has in many countries uh, taken hold and been supported, in fact, by electoral majorities. Uh, right now, we see the rise of what's come to be called populism, uh, which is really uh, large publics supporting authoritarian leadership. One of the ways in which the Marxist theorists, I think, um, weren't careful enough uh, in their analyses was they were looking at what was happening in liberal democracies and to some extent they took for granted the rule of law and uh, the monitoring of public uh, officials uh, which existed in those societies and so they didn't talk enough about or care enough about how one dealt with corruption, how one dealt with authoritarianism. Uh, there has been, a, and here I guess there has been a lot of work that's been important uh, in terms of uh, diversity uh, and gender and that was another subject which really wasn't part of the earlier uh, Marxist critique, that uh, they uh, really weren't, um, uh, what they saw was class, and they didn't see the other kinds of divisions which were extremely important. Now Marx made a terrible error in that he thought that capitalism would so overwhelm other forms of division, uh, that class divisions were the only ones that would matter, and that racial, nationalist, uh, uh, ethnic, those kinds of divisions would fade away, uh, but, but of course he was completely wrong. And so what's one of the things that's important now is the understanding of the intersection, what they like to call intersectionality, between various forms of oppression and division. Susan, Chile is a highly centralized country where at the local level there is not much resources for public investments and capacity in decision making regarding infrastructures, extraction of resources, NIMBYs, or the localization of social housing. Therefore, planning process and planning outcomes within municipalities can be very uneven in terms of these uh, capacities. While high-income high municipalities can afford planning, most do not have the resources or the political willingness to do so. In this context, and your point of view, how critical is the role of urban planners? Well, I don't think the answer has to do with centralization and decentralization. If you look at the United States, it's a highly decentralized country but it doesn't mean that the situation is actually very different in terms of planning. Uh, that uh, you're going to have, if planning is to be important, you both need resources and you need uh, a consensus that planning should be done. And in with the rise of neoliberalism, there's more and more antagonism to planning. Another thing that really happened, of course, was that uh, during the 1960s, much of what people were rebelling against was urban planning because urban planning uh, tended to take the form of urban renewal uh, where people simply lost their houses uh, because roads were going through or because they were seen as slums and they weren't given new housing. Uh, so that uh, planning can be good or bad and a lot of it was bad uh, which gave it a reputation for being um, aggressive, for being top-down, uh, for not being concerned with the welfare of people who weren't powerful. So one has people, people who are powerful can dominate either with or without planning. Uh, it isn't the question of whether you have planning or not. Then in terms of decentralization, uh, in the Dutch example, uh, where there is a good deal of decentralization, the, the national government passes down resources 
to the local governments. Uh, the, in, I think every country, the national government has more capability of raising revenues uh, than localities. Uh, so that what it depends is on the national government both, redis well, both passing through resources but also redistributing them so that it gives more resources to those communities which are least well off. Uh, my example of that, again of Singapore is here you have a totally centralized government uh, and a, an authoritarian government, but uh, it builds public housing for 82% of the citizen population uh, because, and it does enormous amounts of planning uh, because planning has huge legitimacy and because the national state, and of course it's a city state, so there isn't, one of the problems that exists in many countries, uh, certainly in mine, uh, is the tension between the rural and small town areas and the, and the cities. Uh, so that um, a lot of political power in the United States rests with uh, non-urban areas and uh, they don't want to see money spent on mass transit, which they're not going to benefit from. Uh, so it's, Depends. It all depends on the politics of the place, rather than on the question of centralization and decentralization. Okay, and maybe the final question is uh, um, a very broad one, but what's your opinion about Santiago and Chile in these three days? I'm sorry, say it What do I think of Chile? Yes, in this view that you have had in these three days, What's your impression about our city or, or, or Chile in general in these uh, well, terms? That brings up also another aspect of planning, uh, which, uh, as, as you know, uh, until Jane Jacobs wrote her book, The Death of Life of Great American Cities, uh, there was a planning model that said parts of the city should be purely residential and parts should be purely industrial and parts should be purely commercial. She argued for mixed use and for mixed populations, uh, which I think that even with the segregation you have in Santiago, it's a very lively city. The streets are active, you see lots of people around. Uh, you don't have this feeling of desolation that one has in many other uh, cities that I've been to. Uh, so from that point of view, I really like Santiago a lot. I like the fact that it's so kind of bustling. Uh, that uh, and you certainly see in any public place a great variety of people of different social classes. I guess that goes back to your point about the quality of uh, public space. Uh, so I think the public spaces are good, and there are a lot of them. Uh, I'm struck by, uh, as compared to many other cities, how many more parks uh, Santiago has, and that most of them seem reasonably well maintained. I. <laughs> And I guess this reflects where I'm taken when I visit places. I've seen low-income areas, I've seen uh, informal settlements, but I haven't actually seen other really rich parts of these cities. <laughs> so I don't know what they look like. And I can't form much of a judgment of, uh, of how extreme the difference is between the wealthy parts and, and the poor parts. Um, I have an anecdote from many years ago when I was visiting Paris and in the usual way that uh, earnest young graduate students uh, who are assigned to take people like me around, uh, they said, well, we'll take you to a working class district, one of the red suburbs. And I said, well, I want to see La Défense, which was this, at that time, fairly new, a uh, huge business development, business um, commercial uh, development. It was the new office park uh, on the periphery of Paris. And he said, oh, you don't want to go there, it's so boring. And so people tend to, when they see someone like me who's interested in issues of inequality, to basically only want to take, a, take me to places where poor people live. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, to get a better sense of the city, you really need to get to both. Yeah. Correct. Right.
But I like Santiago, I mean, I have to say, I find it a likable place. And I also find the people are very well-mannered, much more so than, say, in New York. <laughs> that uh, uh, people talk softly, they wait for the traffic lights, they, uh, you know, drivers are much more careful than I would have expected, because <laughs> there's a certain... Uh, uh, mythology, I guess, about the Latino driver, certainly in the United States, uh, but people here seem to obey all the traffic laws. So I think it's a nice place to be. Okay, thank you very much again. You are welcome. Mm -hmm.